Cyanide, like CO, has both its highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest unfilled molecular orbital on carbon. As a result, according to MO theory, cyanide should always bind to the metal exclusively through carbon. This certainly is supported by the data. There are literally thousands of structurally characterized metal cyanides, and these are very common complexes known for decades. In fact, Alfred Werner and his research group prepared many cyanide complexes like these, usually as sodium or potassium salts, all bound through the carbon. Imagine our surprise when we carried out this reaction in our labs. We took a novel yttrium-2 complex, which is D1, a very reactive metal radical, and treated it with either terp-butyl isonitrile or trimethyl isonitrile. To get a new yttrium-3 complex, we thought it would be a cyanide, but it isn't. Single crystal x-ray diffraction suggested it was the isocyanide with only the nitrogen bound to the metal. The reaction uses a metal electron to eject a tert-butyl radical from the CN-containing organic. This breaks a carbon-carbon or carbon-nitrogen bond. X-ray diffraction by itself is insufficient evidence for this sort of thing since the electron density difference between carbon and nitrogen is pretty small. Probably the best evidence that the complex is the isocyanide is the C13 yttrium-89 coupling constant in the C13 NMR spectrum. Yttrium has a spin one-half nucleus and the coupling to the Isocyanide carbon in our compound is 9.8 Hz. Yttrium carbon one bond couplings are about 50 to 75 Hz, which is what you would expect for a regular carbon bound cyanide. The two bond couplings are typically 5 to 12 Hz. Our complex is near the middle of the two bond coupling range, strongly suggesting it is an isocyanide. Very cool, but why is it an isocyanide rather than a cyanide? There are a few other isocyanide complexes known for the main group, like magnesium, and for the F-block, like thorium. For example, here is one from John Earl's group at Berkeley, where they also cleave the CC bond and terbutyl isonitrile, in this case to make a thorium isocyanide. Basically, the first criterion to get an isocyanide is there can't be significant pi backbonding. We have an yttrium 3 d 0 complex, so no backbonding here. Bonding in electropositive metals like lanthanides, magnesium, and yttrium is likely to be quite ionic. If you think about the charges in cyanide, the more electronegative nitrogen in cyanide should have the more negative charge. Natural population analysis suggests that about 75% of the negative charge is on the nitrogen. In other words, the structure we observe is charge controlled rather than being frontier orbital controlled. While MO theory suggests the carbon should be preferred, the charges suggest that the nitrogen should bind. Finally, one of the most important methods for characterization of complexes with diatomics like CO and CN is vibrational spectroscopy, like IR spectroscopy. The CN stretch in free CN-, approximated by terbutyl ammonium cyanide, is 2050 reciprocal centimeters. If you put a substituent on either end of the cyanide, the stretching frequency goes up relative to free CN-. This suggests that the CN bond is getting stronger when we put a substituent on either end. This is due to what's been called lone pair bond weakening, which is a term coined by Sanderson and eventually explained many years later by Voltron, Hibberty, and other workers. I, I don't want to go into the cause and all the consequences of the effect here. I, I think that would require its own video, but it's pretty much what it sounds like. If there's a lone pair on an atom with a bond, the bond tends to be a bit weaker than you would expect. Briefly, the reason for this is that the lone pair tends to monopolize the S character on the atom, weakening the other bonds. If you put something on the lone pair, that frees up S character and the bond gets stronger. Effectively, for these compounds, you're taking cyanide and adding tert-butyl cation to one side or the other, which strengthens the CN bond and increases the stretching frequency. For CN tert-butyl or NC tert-butyl, there's about a 100 reciprocal centimeter difference. The derivative with the tert-butyl group on the carbon has a higher stretching frequency than the one with the tert-butyl group on nitrogen. The lower electronegativity carbon uses more S characters to support the lone pair than the more electronegative nitrogen. This is due to what's called bent rule, which could also be its own video someday. As a result, putting a group on the carbon makes a bigger difference in the stretching frequency because it frees up more S character to use in the CN bond. The same should be true if you put a metal that can't backbond on cyanide instead of terbutyl. If the metal is on the carbon, the stretching frequency should be about 100 wave numbers higher than if on the nitrogen. 
Our CN stretch in our isocyanide complex comes at 2054 reciprocal centimeters. We don't see the other isomer where the carbon is attached instead of the nitrogen, so I can't tell you experimentally what that number is. But Harder and co-workers described a magnesium system where they observed the cyanide and isocyanide in equilibrium. As we would expect, their MGNC isomer is about 100 reciprocal centimeters lower in frequency than their MGCN. Our compound stretching frequency of 2054 is pretty close to their isocyanide value as well. The Arnold Group's thorium compound has an isocyanide stretch nearly the same as our yttrium complex at 2046. In other words, if you have low backbonding in the system, it looks like the isocyanide stretch will be around 2050 and the cyanide will be around 2150. Obviously, there are far more details in the full paper, which came out in 2023, including synthesis of the yttrium 2 complex and its stability, EPR spectroscopy calculations, magnetic measurements, and cyclic voltammetry. These compounds were prepared to work out the synthesis before attempting similar lanthanide chemistry where we hope to make molecular magnets. Actually, we've already made them, but the papers aren't published yet. This is a collaboration with the Demir Group, who graciously provides the magnetism expertise for the project. Thanks for watching this short video. If you enjoyed this video and want to support future videos coming on topics like this one, please subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. We make these videos for fun and as a way of interacting with and giving back to the community, so we greatly appreciate your support. Thanks.